Whoa! What is it? What? Oh! Oh, no! Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> you must be from the Bravo team. It's kind of amazing that one of the most influential and revered games to ever exist has moments like these in it. Yeah, you're right. But just take a look at this. It's forest. Oh my god. Resident Evil is a classic in every sense of the word. It's had a profound impact on not just the gaming landscape, but horror media in general. It's cited as one of the reasons zombies made a resurgence in popularity in the late 90s, and the makers of quite a few well-regarded zombie movies point to Resident Evil specifically as being an influence. More importantly for this video, it created an entire genre of video games. It's the phrase the game keeps shoving in your face every time you load a save file after you die. Survival Horror. What is survival horror? When viewing it with a modern lens, it might seem like it's another in a long list of bad genre labels. Survival implies that you need to, well, survive, and many that feature that tag in their descriptions have some sort of hunger or temperature meter, or at the very least, an emphasis on crafting. If you were stranded in a forest or a desert island, you would need to think about those things in order to survive. Since fear, much like fun, is entirely subjective, the horror in survival horror could also be subject to scrutiny depending on the game. I won't bore you with semantics any more than I have already, but playing the PlayStation 1 Resident Evil helped me understand what survival horror truly means, or at least what it likely meant. When watching a horror movie, if you get too scared, you can look away and the movie will keep on playing. The characters will live or die without any involvement from you, the viewer, so there's no pressure. That's not the case in most video games. Your actions determine if you'll eventually see the end credits. Even ignoring, for now, the possibility that you could actually get so scared that you physically can't keep pushing onwards, you still have to be skilled enough and resourceful enough to make it to the end in one piece. If we can distill the word horror into any piece of media that tries to scare, unease, or frighten the user, then any game that claims to do those things is a horror game. Likewise, any game where you can take damage and die, in a way, is a survival game. You're trying to stay alive to the end. This might be an overly simplistic view, but really, put those two words together and that's likely where that phrase came from. In this instance, the word survival is just the video game keyword, signaling that this piece of media requires the user to survive to see the full horror experience. You need to be an active participant to make it through. With how far the gaming medium has come in the last 25 years, I'm not sure if my idea on the origins of the genre label apply much anymore. Perhaps the real question is, could a movie ever be classified as survival horror? If survival is the replacement word for interactive, I don't think so. All that being said, I don't think Resident Evil is scary, but I don't think that's a bad thing. First of all, obviously my brain has been conditioned and become accustomed to much more realistic and gory pieces of media, so the fact that this zombie turning around cutscene doesn't do anything for me doesn't say much on its own. That aside, although I played RE1, 2, and 3 on the PS1 for the first time only this year, to its credit, RE2 did have moments where it genuinely startled me. RE1 didn't have anything of the sort. Again, at the time, this wasn't the kind of thing you'd expect from a video game. This isn't meant to be a slight against the first game by any means, but if anything, it just resonates with a point I've long been wanting to make. Survival horror games, to me, have so much more potential to be incredible because they need to have a real game with mechanics and systems underneath it. Resident Evil 1 is fucking great, and it's not because it's scary, it's because the gameplay loop is so rock solid. In many of my favorite survival horror titles, the first playthrough is practically my least favorite. My friend will likely remember a time where I literally couldn't keep playing Dead Space 2 because I was so frightened of what was up ahead. I would pause the game after every scary sound and take a break. I like the allure of being scared, and absolutely love watching horror movies, but because my input is required to keep the train rolling, it feels so much more visceral, which almost stops me from continuing. I don't have to stare at the screen and hold W to keep watching a horror movie, but with certain horror games that I can't bring myself to finish, I have to. Many people love that sensation, and I will admit it does have its charm, but it's not the main appeal of my favorite survival horror games. In a long-lost Darkwood video that I hope sees the light of day at some point, I wrote about something early on in the script that I think applies here as well. 
It's a bit long, but hey, I love Darkwood so much, you're gonna have to bear with me for a bit before we get to the games you came here for. That paralyzing fear is gone, and I don't think I can ever resurrect it. On one hand, it's a shame, as those playthroughs where I didn't know about the game as much as I do now were incredible in their own way. I said paralyzing fear a few times, and really that's what it was. You can see me hiding in a corner afraid to do much else. I even constructed every bear and chain trap I could just in case. Knowing what I do now, it's kind of adorable, really. All of this isn't saying much besides the obvious. The unknown staying unknown is critical to maintaining the horror in a horror game. Once you know the rules at play, you can begin to abuse them. This isn't to say the game wasn't still immersive and atmospheric. The sound design is still something to be marveled at, putting many other games, regardless of genre, to shame. I was still completely engrossed in the world and was susceptible to any new threats or surprises, but it's pretty clear that some semblance of the game doesn't work for me anymore. However, even though I supposedly stripped the game of its purpose, being scary, because the game is outstanding in other areas, I kept playing it, again and again. This is what separates surface-level horror roller coasters from the more substantial survival horror. There's a genuinely fun game here, not just to be scared by, but to be played and enjoyed. Darkwood really is the perfect example of this, but I think it still applies to the best of the early RE games as well. While, yes, after a playthrough or two, there's not much here that will genuinely frighten you anymore, but instead of that game being worthless, the horror setting gets repurposed in a way. No longer are you wondering when the next scare will jump out at you while you desperately try to survive the unknown. Instead, you get to play a tense, methodical action game with horror elements in a dark and grounded setting. Darkwood especially gets to have its cake and eat it too, as the first playthrough is some of the best slow burn horror you could ever ask for, but every playthrough after still utilizes its same incredible atmosphere to provide a real sense of place in these woods, building tension for whenever the next monster decides to pop out of the woodwork attempting to eat you. These games exist in their own bubble in my brain. While many will joke about wanting to experience Skyrim or Breath of the Wild for the first time again, I would rather play Darkwood or Resident Evil 7 for the second time again. I'm no longer cowering in fear because I'm too terrified to move, instead I'm focusing more on the mechanics and utilizing what I learned previously to survive better. There's still mystery, since I haven't figured everything out yet, but now I have a better understanding of the intricacies the horror was hiding before. Going against the simplistic previous definition from earlier, another key component of survival horror, in my mind anyway, is how limited your supplies are, and your relatively small carrying capacity. Inventory management has found its way into loads of games, regardless of genre, but Resident Evil, even though it was one of the first to do it, puts almost all of them to shame. I realize it's not fun to be restricted to only a handful of items at a time, but it isn't supposed to be. This inventory system isn't here to cause annoyance, it aids the overall goal of making the player feel vulnerable. Although at times it can feel like you're simply ferrying items back to the magic box, this strict one-slot-per-item inventory system is simple perfection. The limitation encourages minimalism for you to really evaluate what you'll need for your next mansion outing. It's of course safer to have a healing item, two guns, and ammo, but only one slot left for a key item or a new pickup is taking a chance in a different way. There's a degree of risk versus reward to every safe room exit. Taking the risk of exploring a new area with few items may pay off when you find a boon of ammo and health you're now able to hold. You could also run into enemies and take damage you otherwise could have avoided, possibly even leading to your death. The ink ribbons are how you save, but since they're also a finite resource, rationing them is far smarter than using them every single time you make it to a safe room. This means when you're out exploring, you may not have saved in a while, further adding pressure to make it out of any encounter alive, even if you lost ammo and health in the process. Ink ribbons take up an inventory slot on their own, and aren't always placed next to a save spot or an item chest, meaning not only is the act of saving your game diegetic, the tool you need for saving your progress is treated the same as every other inventory item, forcing you to carefully weigh the ramifications of grabbing it in the first place. It's kind of incredible how much this limited space impacts the choices you'll make, whether on your first playthrough or even your fifth. It is a bit frustrating that you can't discard items in your inventory, trade with something else you see, and use or combine them right away without grabbing them, but once you learn about those quibbles, you can plan accordingly. On my fourth playthrough, I knew I would need to grab the gold emblem before I could place the wooden one in its place, but I didn't have enough space to have both concurrently. 
To get around this, I inserted the blue gem into the tiger, thus freeing up a slot, but instead of snagging the reward straight away, I chose not to take the crest, did the emblem swap first, then came back for the blue gem trade afterwards. Being efficient and saving trips to the item chest is surprisingly enthralling after you've played the game long enough, but even when you're just starting out, it's just as engaging. When you're unfamiliar with the enemy layout, item placement, and game itself to some extent, you simply won't have any idea if the next unopened door will lead you to supplies, or something more deadly. That unknown is always in the back of your mind when deciding how prepared your character should be, as is the last time you saved in case you risked it too much and now have to suffer the consequences. Saying the early RE games are fairly punishing is probably something most could agree on, but really, the subtleties of its difficulty are more interesting than a lot of other titles. This was long before dynamic difficulty tuning could be implemented to aid players who were struggling, meaning everything in the game is preset. The enemies, their placements, the quantity of ammo and healing items, and their locations as well. Bullets won't drop from defeating enemies, and there are no shops for you to purchase more when you run out. All that exists and will exist is set in stone in specific locations within this game world for you to find. All you have control of is your character and how well you play. And also the difficulty selection if you have a version that has that option. Because everything is static and what lies ahead is mostly clouded in mystery for a first time player, certain mistakes will have varying degrees of noticeable impact. Getting damaged enough by enemies so that you die before you can heal is fairly straightforward. This acute mistake will force you to revert back to your previous save. However, using a lot of ammo on enemies that could have been left alone, using herbs and first aid sprays to heal yourself after taking multiple bouts of avoidable damage, and being frightened enough to use your ink ribbons early on might come back to haunt you later. Part of the core gameplay loop is exploring new areas, finding supplies, and bringing them back to the magic chest, and there may be times where you think you have enough ammo and healing items to last a lifetime, only to realize much later on that your previous cavalier attitude unknowingly doomed your entire save file. This could come in the form of not having enough ammo for a boss fight, or lacking ink ribbons near the end of the game. Neither are technically soft locks, since you do have a knife and you don't necessarily need to save, but especially for a casual first time playthrough, these adversities may be too much to overcome. Seemingly insignificant mistakes eventually dole out a delayed and much harsher punishment. This is why it's sometimes almost better to forego your sense of immersion and test out the parameters and limitations of the game world. Running into danger and doing stupid things just to revert back to a recent save once you've attained crucial information. I can't bring myself to do that, however, which is likely why my second playthroughs are always the most enjoyable. Don't get me wrong, I do naturally test and figure things out the first time through, but the resources I've lost in the process are gone since I refuse to abuse the save system. Now I know that these skinless zombies respawn, so using precious ammo in an attempt to clear them out is a complete waste. Now I know that enemies don't carry over their health when you leave and return to a room, meaning attempting to garner space by abusing their reset positions will only waste your bullets. This is a double lesson, since now I know if I already fired into an enemy X amount of times, I may as well finish them off right then and there, otherwise that ammo is lost for no reason. Now I know that enemies can't be damaged if they're in certain animations, so waiting to fire only when they're vulnerable is the most efficient use of your supplies. I now know that dogs, hunters, spiders, and zombies all make specific sounds, so when you walk into a new room, it's safer to wait a while to hear which enemy could be coming your way. Much smarter than forcing the camera to switch positions only to be greeted by a hunter or a zombie. Now I know that hunters can stun lock me into oblivion, so I better avoid this area, or take them out one at a time with a decent gun equipped right away. Even though their jump attack into a slash is annoying, when you're mostly just trying to get by after you know where you're going, you can pretty reliably avoid damage by running towards their right arm. This next lesson was a bit more specific, but bear with me. You can't discard anything in your inventory, and you can't use items, like blue herbs, unless your health status actually calls for it. The only way to get rid of items is by using the chests, which Rebecca can't utilize, meaning if you stupidly grabbed the blue herbs as her, thinking those would somehow be helpful with the giant plant problem, you now can't grab enough bottles to actually solve the puzzle, therefore you need to reload a save, or intentionally get poisoned by the wasps, so you can use a blue herb, giving you enough open inventory slots. Yes, I realize this was an absurdly unlikely scenario, but it did happen somehow. All of this is, of course, basic trial and error that you could easily argue every game ever made has to some extent. 
unless you want to sit through hours and hours of tutorials, some things will simply have to be left up to the player to figure out. Don't get me wrong, I'm happy that's the case, but this is why it's nice when the game itself is short enough and mechanically sound enough to warrant a second go-around. There's an idea that Matthew Matosis brought up in his Beautiful Joe commentary that's grown on me quite a lot. In terms of fairness in games, there's initial fairness and subsequent fairness. The argument was in reference to the extremely tight window on the highest ranking on a few levels, which newcomers would almost assuredly never be able to achieve. That isn't so bad when the game clearly encourages multiple playthroughs, where you'll strive to get better and better. This is kind of how I feel about many action games, including certain survival horror titles, but not necessarily in terms of a scoring system. No matter how cheesy I thought specific enemies were, or how brutally punishing the lack of checkpoints could be, on a second go-around, it's all more than fair. The lessons you've learned throughout don't just aid the later stages of that save file, they go a long way in making the next one all the more enjoyable. The inclusion of a second character, which has their own cutscenes, characters, and unique gameplay differences, is just evidence that even the designers thought as much. Maybe they too appreciated the feeling of familiarity but not mastery, which is how I would label it. While you will know where the majority of the items, enemies, and bosses will be, I don't think that's strictly necessary to get the sensation that I'm talking about. Narratively, mechanically, and even geographically, you'll be acclimated to this game, so really, maybe it would be even more enjoyable if the items were moved around a bit, or the puzzles modified in some way. In fact, I know that's the case, because there are many different iterations on the original Resident Evil, and everything I said holds true. The lessons you learned stay with you, and the layout of the environment in your head is still there, but now you get to utilize it for a slightly different challenge. A range mode in the director's cut does a decent job, and Deadly Silence on the DS has its pros and cons, but really, the remake itself is the best example there is of providing a somewhat similar yet somewhat different playthrough. Diving into a setting that's familiar, with mechanics you're already accustomed to, but with specific alterations made by the designers that you aren't aware of is a genuinely amazing experience. The reason I say designers there is I know randomizers exist, and I do think those are cool, but knowing that real people deliberately chose what to keep the same and what to change makes it so much more enjoyable for me. I loved Off the Record for that reason, and even though the story revelations won't significantly differ, the items, enemies, and other secrets being moved around, added, or changed provides an equivalent level of surprise. The main character, the one that's always present regardless of which version you play, or even which stars member you select, is the mansion. This is one of the most iconic settings in video game history, and it's easy to see why. It manages to be entirely convoluted and nonsensical, but also easy to understand and reliable. The amount of random puzzles, locked doors, and secret entrances makes you wonder how anyone not in on it could ever find their way, but because you'll have to explore this area so thoroughly, you begin to just know where things are. After a couple times through, you may not even bother grabbing the maps anymore, since you know where every room is already. This wouldn't be possible if not for the dedication to making every inch of this mansion ridiculous and unique. Why on earth would there be so many different door designs for the interior of a domicile, regardless of size? Because it helps the player remember which rooms are which. You could argue the plethora of odd traps, puzzles, secret entrances, and conspicuous art pieces are somehow connected to keeping the lab underneath unknown, I suppose, but even without that in-world reasoning, the result of all these strange level design choices makes this setting extremely easy to read at a glance. For how often people bicker about genre labels, I'm kind of surprised no one calls these games Metroidvanias. You don't necessarily get power-ups, but you backtrack through the same areas, often multiple times, finding keys to advance to the next section, acquiring better weaponry, and locating secrets along the way. You could call this a linear game, since events need to happen in a certain order to some extent, and on a macro scale, your character will always start at the mansion, go through the guardhouse, then go back to the mansion, and finally into the tunnels and research lab in that same cadence every time. However, on a more micro scale, there are many things you can do in whatever order you like, or outright skip. This can range from ammo or health pickups, key items, and even entire rooms. My favorite is bypassing an armor key door entirely to get the shotgun early when playing as Jill. Oh, Barry! That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> You're right! This is the infamous Jill sandwich scene that I heard joked about for almost a decade now, but what I didn't know about it before playing was that if you hear these specific cheesy lines, it means you've acquired a valuable weapon before you otherwise might have. 
All this comes down to the player learning and understanding the mansion. What rooms connect to what, which doors lead to where. It's incredible that by even just the placement of the camera and the wallpaper design, most veteran players could tell you exactly where this location is and what rooms are near it. Same with this, and this, and this. I'll talk about the camera in a moment, but what's so interesting is how different this is to Darkwood, yet both rely heavily on exploration and the utilization of items acquired on the map. Darkwood randomized its layout to some extent for every playthrough, but the distinct buildings are mostly what you'd expect once you find them. The items don't necessarily change locations, but the locations themselves get moved around. Both games achieve their goals perfectly, but they go about it in the opposite way. Darkwood wants you to feel lost in this ever-growing forest, so the locations being in different areas or the entire map being a different orientation forces players to wander almost aimlessly. Resident Evil wants you to remember this building's layout so you can return to certain rooms with key items. You will likely get lost quite a lot early on, but the consistency assures that the longer you play, the easier it will be to traverse this maze of a structure. The camera angles also play a role in this memorization process. The backgrounds are pre-rendered, meaning they're essentially the equivalent to old Scooby-Doo cartoons where the objects that will be interacted with are colored a different shade to stand out. Considering the director's cut arrange mode switches up some of the angles to make that playthrough feel even more disorienting, I would imagine it wasn't terribly difficult for the devs to play with the camera a bit when designing the game initially. It might sound obvious, but it's always worth keeping in mind that everything you see and hear in a game was most likely meticulously thought over in development. The decision on where to place the camera, its height, how zoomed in it is, and when it switches to a different shot is extremely important to the overall feel of certain rooms. These fixed positions seem to be a pretty divisive issue among fans of the series. For what it's worth, I'm perfectly fine with the tank controls, so for me, that's not an issue at all, and I quite like how artsy the varying camera positions and angles are. A positive quality many seem to point out is that these awkward angles create a sense of foreboding for what's to come. You don't know what's up ahead, so it could build suspense and ultimately lead to a scare. That is true to an extent, but I find that to be the worst aspect about the camera. I understand that unless it's a first-person game, you won't ever truly see what the character will see, but I really don't think it makes sense that my character should so clearly be able to see two feet in front of her, but I can't. The times where your firing stance pulls you forward or backward, changing the angle for the worse, is just the icing on top. It does force you to use your ears a bit more, which is par for the course for a good action horror game, but it feels pretty ridiculous at times. Ridiculous is something you could say about basically every single cutscene and bit of dialogue in the game. The cheesiness of it all is endearing and is a mainstay in the series at this point, but I think there's a big divide in what RE1 provided and tried to do compared to the later entries in the series. First of all, I think it's important to point out that the Resident Evil franchise as a whole has somehow nailed a very delicate balance. It's horror enough to make us tense when exploring this dark and grounded setting, it's interesting enough to get us to wonder about the conspiratorial story and embrace the science-y backdrop and lore. It's ridiculous enough for us to ignore the plot holes and other random absurd events. It's stupid enough to get us to laugh at the cheesy moments and bad dialogue. And it's cool enough to let us enjoy the times where truly badass shit happens. Even if it looks a little more goofy nowadays, using a rocket launcher to blow up the big monster at the end is about as cool as you can get. Cool, horror, interesting, ridiculous, and stupid. The Resident Evil series is all of it, even if many of the games lean into only a few of these at the expense of others. One thing most would agree that all of them are, to an extent, is cheesy. The thing is, cheese can take on multiple forms. In Resident Evil 1, it has a so-bad-it's-good thing going for it. The dialogue and delivery are so unbelievably awful that you can't help but be moved by it. Whoa. This hall is dangerous! It's clear that the designers were trying to make the game feel like a horror movie in some ways, as the live-action introduction and ending sequences show, but I also get the feeling that the voice acting being this bad wasn't intentional, and that's why I like it so much. Okay, let's separate again. Just a moment. I found something. What is it? It's a weapon. It's really powerful. Especially against living things. Better take it with you. But how about you, Barry? I have this. Thank you. I'll take this then.
This is a topic that's been plaguing my brain for quite some time now, but not with games. Everyone knows The Room is one of the worst movies ever made, but it's also a really fun watch and is genuinely one of my favorite films. People are very strange these days. I used to know a girl, she had a dozen guys. One of them found out about it, beat her up so bad she ended up in a hospital on Guerrero Street. <laughs> what a story, Mark. Birdemic is fucking terrible, but I'd gladly watch it again and again. You know what I wouldn't watch again and again? Birdemic 2, since they became aware of how bad the first movie was and clearly leaned into it. There's a difference between trying to make something good only to fail and trying to make something bad on purpose. The sincerity of it all gets lost in the process. This is why I don't bother watching any of the Sharknado films, since they're obviously trying to make it so bad it's good, which is far less interesting to me than a low-budget creator striking out earnestly. Although it would be true to say that Resident Evil 1, 5, and 7 are all cheesy and over the top, hearing Wesker say, Stop it! Don't open that door! feels very different than watching Chris punch a boulder, or Ethan Winters being an absolute dumb fuck of a person constantly, all the time. There's a line that was crossed at some point where they can no longer organically create these awkward moments, but instead manufacture them since it's now part of the formula. Don't get me wrong, I love RE7 and have a fondness for 5 as well, but playing Resident Evil 1 on the PS1 for the first time this year, after already seeing how much the series intentionally jumped the shark, just made me feel so happy. It's like watching a home movie of a famous musician or athlete doing the thing they love as a kid. There's a sense of pride, almost, in seeing the humble origins after becoming accustomed to the more refined modern adaptations. That was a lot of words to essentially say, I love how unintentionally bad Resident Evil 1's dialogue is. This house is dangerous. There are terrible demons. Ouch! Besides the voice lines, the audio for the game is mostly fine, however, the music will greatly depend on which version of the game you play. Most people would agree that the DualShock version of the director's cut has the worst music, but honestly, I don't think it's so bad. There's only one song in particular that I think is a significant downgrade, and that's the basement theme. truly among the worst bits of music in any game I've ever played. That being said, I actually prefer the DualShock version score when you return to the now-empty main hall. Wesker! Help me look for him, Jill. And don't leave this hall for the time being. look for him, Jill, and don't leave this hall for the time being. Find anything, Jill? Both set the mood of a strange and mysterious situation, but the melancholic feel of the DualShock version just hits really hard. It hammers home the hopeless sensation of being trapped in this horrifying night with nothing else but the empty walls of the main hall to rely on. It also faintly resembles a ticking clock, almost like time is slowly running out, which honestly is fairly anxiety-inducing. I was initially going to talk about how much I preferred the original save room music over DualShocks, but a commenter on this video changed my mind on the matter. Quote, while the OG theme is a lot more calming as a whole, the DualShock Ver hits the feeling of you're safe for now, keeping the vibe still unsettling." Unquote.
After thinking about it quite a lot, I think I agree with PR Rocker. Yes, the safe rooms are a refuge from the dangers of the mansion, but you can't stay there. This is a temporary sensation of safety. The main melodic notes of the song being so light and airy is analogous to the comfort you feel at that moment. It's fleeting, out of reach, but you want it to stay. The more I mull it over, the more I think this might be one of the best safe room songs in the entire series. Although RE1 is influential in a lot of ways that I appreciate, one that I'm not as happy about is the inclusion of dog enemies. In this game, they aren't too bad, one handgun bullet will knock them back, and you can mostly stun lock them without too much trouble, but even just going to the remake, that isn't the case. Dogs are the worst enemy type in all of gaming, and are used far too often. It makes sense for them to show up in so many games, since they're very common pets, and are big enough to be a threat if they turn feral, but still, I hate them. The enemy variety as a whole, however, considering that this is around the time of polygons being fairly new, and the game itself being mostly about zombies, is pretty impressive. Zombies fill the mansion, and are the only consistent threat early on. This almost makes every other encounter that much better, since you become so familiar with these undead humans wandering about, and have likely figured out how to take them down or avoid them. Crows haunt my nightmares and are a huge nuisance if you don't run away, and dogs serve as a great ambush moment considering they're the reason you ran into this mansion for safety in the first place. You have Yawn the giant snake, Black Tiger the giant spider, two different evil plants, some weird monkey zombie creatures called chimeras, the wasps if you want to count those, and of course, the hunters. The hunters are what fill the mansion after you complete the guardhouse. Essentially, for half of the game, you're greeted by these stupid lizard-looking dudes in place of zombies. I'll be honest, I don't much care for these guys, since their attack animations are so annoying, and they're kinda goofy looking. Something had to make the mansion dangerous again, however, so overall it does make sense. The fact that the first time you encounter them is after you see one of them open a door, you might be worried that they'll chase you through the rooms. They don't, though. Later on, during a zombie ambush cutscene, it shows one of them opening a door too. Seeing the hunter grab the handle was a shocking moment, but to then see a normal zombie do it right after? Ah, uh, I don't know, it kind of devalues the hunter introduction. Something that these early Resident Evil games condition its players to do, perhaps without even them realizing it, is making trades. Every single enemy encounter is an exchange. The most obvious is expending X amount of bullets to clear a hallway of zombies. You traded your ammo for safety, both now and in the future. If you want to conserve your ammo, or are completely empty on your way to get more, maybe you'll trade your health, which will likely lead to you using a healing item. Both equal the same thing, you getting to your destination, but the decision on which resource to give up is always present. Even when you manage to avoid the enemy entirely, you're still trading your momentary safety and preservation of supplies for a hostile remaining in the area, and potentially you wasting time by luring it out. The worst trades are when you lose all three, time, ammo, and health, but still don't get the benefit of an enemy being removed from the play space. This is less likely to happen the better you get, but early on, you might not know a zombie is dead yet and run to a different room before dealing the killing blow, or just need to rush to safety any way you can. My favorite instance of this trade mentality is with the first yawn fight. You don't actually need to defeat him, you just have to grab the crest in the back of the room. Fighting him straight up will exhaust munitions, but it's the more reliable and safe option. Running to the back without firing a single shot is a huge risk, since his body can sometimes get in your way, and he deals a lot of damage. If you manage to pull it off without using healing items as well, you saved yourself a boss fight's worth of supplies. Even better, as if the right conditions were met depending on the character you're playing as, you'll be cured of the poison status if you were hit, and healed completely. Literally the heist of the century. The many differences within each character's playthroughs is honestly staggering. I can't believe this game came out in 1996 and fucking nailed what a video game should and could be. This likely isn't even something you'd be able to fully comprehend unless you played the game with very slight alterations dozens of times. I found this game FAQ forum where Beer SX Repeat explains in detail all the different ways cutscenes and side character interactions can play out. I've tested quite a few of these, and it's just, well, I've already said it, staggering. There are a few yes-no questions Jill and Chris are given by each of their side characters, but you would never know at first glance how far down the line that choice permeates. 
harder to pin down are the invisible decisions, the ones that aren't presented to you but still impact whether characters will die or if you see certain cutscenes. How quickly you got to a certain area in the mansion, which rooms you decided to enter in what order, and even if you choose to wait for Barry while he gets another rope. If I didn't know these branching choices were possible, I would have likely just moved on, but unbelievably, if you wait there, yeah, he comes back with another rope. I may be giving out too much credit here, but it's impressive how much this game responds to the player's input, even if they might not realize it right away. Going back to the Jill Sandwich line, this won't trigger if you unearthed any of the other Barry scenes first, meaning you'll die and she really will become a Jill Sandwich. Or you can go back through the door since it isn't locked if you didn't trigger the cutscene. <clears throat> Even though this version doesn't classify either character in terms of difficulty, Jill feels significantly easier than Chris. The addition of the lockpick and bazooka in addition to two extra inventory slots, make it a much more lenient play experience. Jill is the master of unlocking, I guess, and is handed a lockpick right out of the gate. This doesn't count as an inventory item, you just unlock certain doors and desks when you encounter them. Chris, meanwhile, gets the sword key early on to open those locked doors, and has to find and carry small keys to open locked desks, both of which take up an inventory slot. I would say maybe this was to balance out the three types of ammo Jill can carry for the bazooka, explosive, flame, and acid, but her two additional slots were more than enough to compensate. Those extra ammunition types do take up more space, but they wreak havoc against later enemies and even bosses. Even more, many handgun clips you found as Chris turn into bazooka rounds for Jill, which aren't even close to the same level of usefulness. Chris does get a flamethrower for a small portion, but because the item chests and the tunnels before Black Tiger are non-existent, it's just one more annoyance. Jill also flat out gets more ink ribbons, which I didn't realize at first, but it would certainly make sense as to why I struggled so much with my initial playthrough as Chris. Plus the fact that the DualShock version only gives you two each pickup instead of three. And I also clearly just wasted a few of them because I was being too careful. Really quick side note, because I got so used to this punishing lack of saves, every other iteration and even future RE title felt way too forgiving. Far too many ink ribbons, you basically never have to worry about running out. This kind of goes against what I said earlier, how you might be low on ink ribbons on a first playthrough, but I mean, it is still possible, but yeah, these games give them out like candy after a while. Anyway, back to the character differences. Since Jill can also get the shotgun faster thanks to Barry, can use that numeric keypad door on the second floor eventually, and has access to the Magnum just like Chris does, she feels much easier on the whole. Barry also removes a zombie on his own in a cutscene, which technically does save you some ammo. Of course, playing the game with both characters is the ideal, so picking one over the other doesn't really make sense for a game like this, but I think I would prefer if Jill never received the Magnum, since she already has the grenade launcher, and it would be nice if Chris got one or two more ink ribbons. Either way, I really, really love the two-character option and how it genuinely affects the game. I wish more games would do this sort of thing, make a relatively short game, but give you slightly altered variations of the same experience. I'll likely make the argument in a future video that Resi 2 did this idea better, but it being the originator means it deserves some respect. Not every game could pull this off without it feeling tiring or repetitive. Because the gameplay loop is phenomenal and the game itself isn't terribly long, being able to go in again with differences thrown in here and there is just incredible. Can and be damned, I want to see different takes on the same thing. Before I move on to the remake, there's a few miscellaneous things I want to talk about real quick. The MO discs being required for the good endings, where you can save your partner, are a really great inclusion. Exploration is already such a big part of this game, and sprinkling significant end cutscene influencing key items around that don't show their use until the lab is a really nice way to reward curious players who searched every area they could. Since you'll be given a rocket launcher in the final Tyrant fight, and you can't remove items when you aren't near a magic chest, it was really smart of the designers to include the battery pack before the ending sequence. Initially, it annoyed me, since it was so pointless and wasted an inventory slot, but then I realized that was the point, to free up that slot so there wouldn't be a soft lock issue where a player couldn't grab the rocket launcher. Likewise, having the signal flare beforehand could trick players into thinking that was the reason they needed the open slot, just to alert the helicopter, then boom, here's a coolest shit weapon, actually. Even though the game might feel punishing in quite a few ways, 
It also respects the player enough to tell them if a key has been completely used up, and gives them the option to discard it right then and there. It's nice when a somewhat unforgiving game throws the player a bone now and then. Something about the way the zombies react when being shot by gunfire is ridiculously satisfying. I don't know if it's the blood sprites or the limbs falling off or what, but it just feels great. Similarly, seeing the blood drain out of a downed zombie to know for sure that they're finally dead is a great visual indicator. Another nice visual cue relates to the walking backwards animation. If there's an enemy nearby, Chris and Jill will visibly pull their shoulders back as if they're frightened of being grabbed. If the enemies aren't that close, or if there aren't any nearby at all, they'll back up normally. I'd say the remake does this far better, since it's much, much more clear in that game, but still, this can come in handy in this version as well, mostly around sharp corners or when the camera doesn't show what's right in front of you. Accessing the computer in the lab is honestly super rad, interfacing with the keyboard for the username and two passwords, and seeing Jill and Chris react to getting it right or wrong is just adorable. I know none of the dialogue should really be looked at under a microscope, since the scripting itself is bizarre beyond belief, but really, what does Rebecca mean her interpretation is off a little? Wait, what is that? My interpretation is off a little. I was in band class for the entirety of middle and high school, and I've never heard anyone say that. You just played the wrong notes, lady. Also, Chris, you just saw Rebecca in the safe room. What do you mean, is that you, Rebecca? It's me, Chris. Is that you, Rebecca? Wesker saying, go to hell, after he's revealed Tyrant was one of the funniest moments in the game, and every time I hear it, I laugh. Go to hell. Jill will join you too. What? Don't come this way! No! Yep, this is me. You're probably wondering how I got myself into this situation. Well, it all started last week Tuesday, when I got a call from- The Resident Evil Remake was released in 2002 for the Nintendo GameCube, and has since been ported to modern consoles and PC with widescreen support. Not only is this one of the best remakes to ever exist, it's one of the best Resident Evil games in its own right. It manages to be a competent representation of the gameplay, setting, and story found in the original, while also sneaking in a plethora of surprises for experienced players. I'll of course talk about the newer RE makes in future videos, but something that seems obvious is that the fixed camera positions with the pre-rendered backgrounds isn't something super common these days. The newer remakes went away with it in favor of a third-person behind-the-shoulder view, and while I can readily say those games are enjoyable in their own ways, one much more than the other, they clearly don't provide the same sensation that the original Resident Evil remake does. Maybe I'm giving these familiar camera angles too much credit, but there's a sense of comfort in them in a way. So much of this game will catch veterans off guard, so the pre-rendered backgrounds and cinematic camera almost exist to reassure players that, hey, it's alright, it's the same thing you've loved before, don't worry about it. It's interesting how this return to classic feel really only hits home nowadays. When this first released, all of the RE games had this style, so it likely wasn't too strange back then. When this was transitioned to newer consoles and PC in 2015, though, players were likely accustomed to the behind-the-shoulder view at that point, so if anything, the more time that goes by with RE games not using this camera system, the more and more the original RE make will stand out. This is why this remake over the others is arguably the best, since it really does grant new fans a true Resident Evil 1 experience. Like I said, though, they didn't just copy and paste the same game over with improved graphics and resolution. There have been some significant changes, new areas entirely, and even gameplay mechanics introduced in this game. Without any context, that might sound worrying. In the wrong hands, a classic game could be butchered if the new team starts to get creative with their alterations. The difference here, however, is that our remake was helmed by the same person who was in charge the first time around, Shinji Mikami. This isn't a team trying to preserve a respected developer's work, this is the same developer making one of their old games again. Given how the director's cut had an arrange mode which moved around a few things, 
and of course the existence of multiple characters that had their own differences, it makes sense that the design team would use this opportunity to do something similar with the remake. Why make an exact replica when we can instead give hardcore fans something they desperately want? Another second playthrough. Better than just being different for the sake of it, it feels like many of the changes were made specifically to play on returning players' expectations. Likewise, what was kept exactly the same works towards that same goal. If everything was different, there wouldn't be the same level of tension when moving around the mansion. You would just accept that it's a brand new game and adjust your headspace to match it. However, moment by moment, there's a consistent back and forth between comfort and unfamiliarity. A reliable rhythm of three repeatable elements will envelop the entire experience. Something drastically different, something slightly changed, and something exactly the same. Let's take a look at the opening hour of Jill's playthrough as an example. Same Barry cutscene at the start, but the door the zombie came in through slams shut when you leave the dining room. Does this mean zombies can travel between rooms now? You're left to explore the mansion like before, and are given the lockpick again as well, but the locked door you normally could open as Jill straight away requires the sword key, which used to be exclusive to Chris. The map of the first floor is still in the statue, and you need to climb onto something to grab it, but the zombie ambush in the connecting hall plays out slightly differently this time. Kenneth dies the same way as before, with the same zombie turning his head cutscene, but he doesn't drop two handgun clips this time, he has a videotape, which you can't watch yet. Behind him used to be a dead end, but now it leads to a new room and a new set of stairs. This leads to a hallway which looks completely new, but is actually one of the later areas in the original game with altered camera angles and a fresh coat of paint. You can't access the West Wing safe room yet, but you can grab this arrow key item, which is used in a different new section, the cemetery, which is connected to the main hall. This brings you to this eerie looking tomb with a foreboding casket hanging high above you. You grab the Book of Curses, which explains a puzzle that's completely new, but it also contains the sword key. You can use that sword key to, essentially, get back on track, entering the familiar looking hallway in the East Wing. However, the dogs normally jump through the windows when you first walk through, but they don't this time. The window does give way slightly, making a cracking noise as you go by, but nothing else happens. Might as well use this afforded breathing room to check if the items are still under the movable furniture, which they indeed are. Everything in this next hallway and adjacent rooms look and feel like you'd expect, and you can even get the shotgun early with Barry saving you once more. However, you may notice that the door next to the safe room presents a text prompt. The knob is almost broken, hinting that you may only get a few uses out of the door itself before it's inaccessible. Over and over, this cadence takes place. The method of acquiring the armor key involves two new areas and a new puzzle item, but it still opens the same door that you found Richard behind in in the original, he's still here, and he still needs serum. The serum is even found in the same room. However, he survives this time, and instead gets eaten by a B.O.W., either Neptune in the Aqua Ring or Yawn in the Attic. He drops the Assault Shotgun, something entirely new to this game, which is an outright improvement in both damage and carrying capacity. Forrest gave up the Ghost much like before, and provides the Grenade Launcher, but now he turns into a zombie and attacks you. The Emblem Swap functions the exact same way in the Music Room, but after you place the Golden One in its spot above the fireplace, the grandfather clock opens its front. You have to solve another short puzzle before it moves out of the way like it did before. The zombie placements are mostly what you'd expect for many rooms in the mansion, and the risk-reward of killing them or keeping them alive is still present, but now there's an entirely new twist. Zombies will stay dead on the ground even after you've left and returned to the room. Maybe at first blush you could attribute this to the advancements in video game technology, Seeing zombie corpses early on as you wander around does enhance the horror atmosphere, but those are actually ticking time bombs. You soon learn that dead zombies eventually turn into a more dangerous threat, Crimson Heads. These are far quicker, will chase after you the moment you enter a room, and can deal damage with their claws. The only ways to prevent them is by never killing the zombie in the first place, blowing their head completely off, or by burning their corpses with the lighter and canteen of kerosene, which you'll have to keep filling up. Your canteen can only hold two douses of kerosene at a time, and the refill tanks aren't infinite, they themselves only hold four uses in total. There aren't many in the mansion in the first place, and their locations are spread very far out. For example, the tank in the East Wing safe room is by far the easiest one to access, but if you've been exclusively refilling your canteen with that one, you may run dry at an inopportune moment. 
There's another one kind of close by in the side courtyard area protected by dogs, but it might not be smart to travel straight from the safe room to that location given that the door only has a couple uses left. What makes this even more tense is that on a first playthrough, you'll never really know when a crimson head will awaken. They stay a corpse on the floor until they suddenly decide to stand up. It can be extremely startling and genuinely terrifying when you see one jump to their feet right behind you. The first playthrough of Resident Evil Remake, more so than the original game, made me feel so frantic and unsure of what my top priority should be. I want to get rid of my keys by finding all the doors they open, but then again, there are still a lot of dead zombies I should deal with before they haunt me in the future. The longer that necessary evil gets delayed, the more anxious I become about returning to that area later on. However, I still don't know where all of the kerosene tanks are, and traveling back again and again to the only one I know about wastes more time, which might not bode well for avoiding crimson heads, so maybe it would be smarter to explore rooms in hopes of finding more kerosene tanks. However, that opens the door, literally, to possibly more zombie attacks, which will make me question whether I can escape unharmed, or if I'll have to kill it to get by, which will then create another zombie body for me to deal with. Inventory space is still of the utmost importance, and the addition of this Crimson Head mechanic adds to your list of things you should maybe keep with you, as Jill the canteen end lighter, and as Chris, only the canteen. However, his inventory space is still limited to 6 instead of Jill's 8, and he doesn't have the lockpick, meaning he'll have to grab basic keys again, but this time, even necessary doors require them. I don't want to sound overly dramatic, but this burning zombie crimson head mechanic is one of the best bits of game design I've ever seen, and showcases how well Mikami and his team understood their own game. Resident Evil is all about inventory management, planning, and trading. This slides in so naturally with all of those core elements, you almost wonder how this wasn't thought of before. As an idea, it's neat enough that you wouldn't be upset if it showed up in other zombie games, but for Resident Evil, it's fucking perfect. Trade one kerosene usage for one zombie corpse disposal. If you plan well enough with your second zombie kill, maybe you can even save some fuel and light both on fire at once. This isn't an exploit or anything, it's an achievement. You'll have to decide whether to use your slots on the lighter and canteen just in case you spot a new zombie corpse that needs removing, or maybe even find an out-of-the-way kerosene tank. The many, many new ambushes in the game go hand-in-hand -hand with this mechanic. In the original game, every zombie you'd encounter was tied to a room, and would be there at the start. Their position was static until they were killed, rooms either had zombies or they didn't. In the remake, you'll likely be spending a lot more time in the mansion before the courtyard, given that there's many new rooms and the puzzles have all been expanded. To fight against the comfort a player might feel when they've successfully cleared out zombies and burned their bodies, some enemies don't get added in until later on. The hallway outside of the evil plant has two coming in the windows, and outside the Jill Sandwich Room has four. This isn't solely to add more hostels onto the play space, it's to undercut any plans the player has formulated so far about the zombies that currently exist in the mansion. For example, the hallway outside of the plant room was empty before they broke in through the windows. In the original, this already had zombies at the start, so the remake isn't giving you more enemies to deal with, it's delaying them, so you couldn't include those in your body count when thinking about how much kerosene you'll need. The four that ambush you outside the Jill Sandwich Room make it that much more of a nuisance if you wanted to grab the kerosene in the side courtyard. I could make the argument that this one isn't as needed, since the door out of the safe room stairwell having so few uses already encourages you to walk the long way. However, this does go well with the surprise dog ambush. Like I said, they don't come through the windows on the initial walkthrough, and won't ever if you only go this direction, but once the zombies bust in and you're faced with fleeing this corner, you'll need to either go through the four new enemies, or turn around and get ambushed by the dogs at last. The doorknob breaking was something I initially wanted to complain about, since it felt like it was a needless punishment, but the addition of the gate in the crow room that leads to the cemetery, thus to the main hall by proximity, makes it flow pretty well all things considered. It's only an issue in the first half of the game anyway. Remember when I talked about those already in place zombie corpses at the start of the game? Those are a lot trickier than I let on. I don't know what happens to this one, he disappears after a while with no explanation, and crows are in the room instead. It isn't a location you're likely to visit much after you get going, so it might not even be something players will notice. This guy, lying down next to that safe room however, at least if I'm not mistaken somehow, is 100% bait. 
Given how close he is to a safe area, you'll likely think of this as an obvious decision. Of course I'll burn the body, why would I want a crimson head right outside this high traffic door? That being said, I once left him alone an entire playthrough and nothing happened, he just vanishes when the hunters show up. What a devious trick this was, goading players into wasting a resource. The text does say it looks like he's been dead for a few hours, so maybe that was the hint to not use the kerosene on him? The final pre-placed zombie does turn into a crimson head, however there's more to him than meets the eye. He's very clearly scripted, since he'll always stand up after you've gained the imitation key and you walk by him to do the armor key transfer. The camera angle is positioned almost perfectly for it to be a scare, so it makes sense. That said, you may notice when you first see him that his feet are red. He won't stand up on his own when you walk by, like every other Crimson Head does, but if you try to burn his corpse after you get the canteen, but before you acquire the imitation key, he interrupts the process and stands up early. Very interesting, this little guy. I'd imagine the designers really wanted this dude to be the first Crimson Head players we'll see, since this area is mostly useless after you acquire the arrow, but you do need to come back for the armor key. Maybe that's also why they placed the decoy zombie near the West Wing safe room, to get players to waste a kerosene usage and hopefully dissuade them from using a precious resource on a seemingly out of the way and lower priority dead body. When it comes to difficulty, there's far more options this time around, even more than what you're presented with at the start. This is very easy, easy, and normal by the way, and I mistakenly chose easy on my first Chris playthrough because of the slightly confusing wording. After you beat the game enough times, you'll unlock hard, then realism survival, then invisible mode. This all feeds into what the original game naturally encouraged, many playthroughs where you get better and better, go faster and faster, potentially even needing fewer bits of supplies. Every advancement in difficulty will remove item pickups, giving you less to work with overall. Even more punishing, they replaced other, far better ammo drops with handgun clips. The bastards. Realism Survival has far more drastic changes. There's no auto-aim anymore, so your character won't snap to the nearest enemy. What's worse, the item boxes are no longer connected. You'll have to manage which items are in which chests throughout the entire playthrough. With Chris's six slots, this can become quite the chore. Invisible mode is quite the doozy, and I certainly haven't finished a playthrough of it, but it just highlights how well considered the backwards walking animation was. This will help you quite a lot to gauge distance on enemies. For me, hard mode felt just about right. As Jill, I only had a few bullets to spare during the final tyrant fight. I also did it in one play session in under five hours. Unbelievably fun, fuck I love this game. However, one thing that became clear was how different the pacing was in terms of difficulty. I wouldn't say it's worse, but the beginning of the remake was by far the most challenging for me, whereas the midway point with the Hunters didn't feel nearly as bad. This is the exact opposite of how I felt in the original. Maybe this points to the Hunters being less cheesy this time around, but I don't even think that's the case, since now they have a claw swipe which stuns you for so much longer than before, and an insta-kill jumping attack. The defensive weapons may have something to do with it, but I think it mostly comes down to unlocking the Magnum earlier than before, the Crimson Heads as a whole, and the lack of ammo for your handgun in the beginning. In the original, every Stars member corpse had a handgun clip, Kenneth having two. There were also more places to explore right out of the gate, whereas now the only side area is the main art room, which leads to a defensive item, then you have to go through the dining hall, up the newly added stairs, and into the hall to collect the arrow. There'll be zombies here with not a whole lot of ammunition about. If you know exactly where to go already, the cemetery is your next destination, which houses two zombies with only shotgun shells to grab, which won't help you at all at this point. The armor key is what opens a lot of the rooms up like before, but to acquire it, you'll now need to use the newly added dog whistle in the newly added second floor balcony, and then fight off at least one dog, two if you aren't fast enough. This was the biggest difficulty spike for my hard playthrough, believe it or not. The shells for the early shotgun were used up fairly quickly in an attempt at beheading troublesome zombies, so all I really had to work with was a couple handgun bullets, one shell, a dagger, and a dream. Everything after this wasn't too bad, which was very surprising considering that this is hard mode. I didn't even take Barry's extremely powerful gun this time, I let him live. The handgun overall feels like it got devalued amidst all the changes. It takes so many bullets to take down a regular zombie anyway, and even then you're not done with them. So when playing as Jill, with her lower tendency to score critical hits, the handgun ammo just piled up as I used other things. I eventually started turning down clips when I found them. 
It was nice to spam the handgun in the lab sections against those goober zombies, but I feel like it came in handy far more often in the original. They used to stun dogs with one hit, but now they don't. Dogs are easier to run past this time, since they have a beginning bow animation before they start attacking, but still. The gameplay differences between Chris and Jill feel more pronounced thanks to the lighter and lockpick switcheroo. I still think having 8 slots makes just about everything in the game easier, but it is nice to have the lighter right away and always with you. It's kind of funny how this is the exact same starting equipment in RE2 with Claire and Leon. When it works, it works, I guess. There is supposedly a max HP disparity between the two, which favors Chris, but I found it really hard to notice if I'm being honest. I couldn't even tell you if this existed in the original or not. Regardless, the extra space for healing items made up for the trade-off in max health. She also doesn't need to fight Plant 42 at all this time, since making and using the V-Jolt is what causes Barry to come save her instead of the reverse in the original, and Richard helps her out with the yawn fight as well, making that skip even easier. On Chris's side, though, the flash grenade is better than the stun gun, since you basically get an instant head explosion out of it, and it can damage nearby enemies to boot. One time, it even took down two hunters. Chris is also better with guns, scoring critical hits more frequently, thus requiring less kerosene to burn zombie corpses. Rebecca being able to heal him was a smart idea, since it went some way in balancing out how much help Barry was to Jill. Speaking of the early shotgun trick, though, this Jill sandwich scene is far more clunky this time around and overall just makes less sense. In the original, you didn't need the sword key, so you could access the shotgun room right away. This time, you do need the sword key, which requires you to go through the dining hall, up the stairs, into the hallway, grab the arrow, return through the dining hall again, only this time you can exit upstairs if you want, go to the graveyard, then nab the key, then make your way over there. For how much they altered the script in the remake to make it sound better, this would have been a great time to change it once more. Barry says he'll check the dining room again, and you'll go the opposite way. When you get saved, Jill asks why Barry isn't in the dining room like he said he was going to be. This exchange makes perfect sense in the original, but here, like, Jill, you didn't go the way you were supposed to either. I get this moment is supposed to raise suspicions on why Barry isn't where he said he would be, but Jill just went through the dining hall and didn't see him. I feel like at the very least, she would bring that aspect of it up as well. Likewise, a new Barry cutscene in the researcher's room upstairs makes almost no sense since you have to lockpick that door open. I'd say, since Jill having the lockpick or not isn't a choice, keep that door unlocked for her playthrough. Maybe this is implying Barry locked the door behind him to be shady, but Jill never even asks about it. With the game being far more realistic looking, and the new, more serious voiceover completely replacing the cheesy, horrible original counterpart, it is a bit more difficult to suspend my disbelief in some cases. The opening cinematic is frankly awesome. The grave tone makes this whole thing feel both mysterious and catastrophic at the same time. This has recently occurred in Raccoon City. There are outlandish reports of families being attacked by a group of about ten people. Victims were apparently eaten. The Bravo team was sent in to investigate, but we lost contact. Look, Chris! Bravo team's helicopter was a derelict. Save for the remaining body of Kevin. We continued our search for the other members, and it turned into a nightmare. Specifically, Jill in shock, pulling the trigger of her now empty gun, watching in horror as her fellow stars member gets eaten alive. Wow, great stuff. But again, all of this almost undermines how silly some of the actions the characters go along with, and the ridiculous mansion itself. Before I get to that though, I want to point out that Wesker saving Chris and Jill in the opening makes a lot of sense. He's been given orders to test out the BOWs in real combat scenarios, the STARS members unwittingly filling that role. I think this works really well, and tiptoes around the plot hole where a backstabbing bad guy does a good thing for no reason early on, seemingly just to further trick the audience. 
That being said, though, splitting up is about the worst decision they could possibly make, and Jill, being the only one not involved in her group of three, somehow just keeps going along with it. She does have a slight arc, kind of, since at the end she gets mad at Chris for wanting to split up before the escape, but still. Barry and Wesker outright tell Jill to go investigate things on her own, and she's totally fine with that idea. What the hell is that sound? It could be a person. Jill, go check it out. We had enough surprises for one day. I'll stay here and secure our escape route in case something happens. Okay. Barry! Barry abandoning Jill in the elevator is fucking hilarious, and I'm glad we're given the option to essentially kill him, which I did of course, because fuck him, dude just yeeted himself up the elevator. <laughs> fucking hell. It's also good that in this scene, she's no nonsense finally, and starts demanding answers. Start talking. Calm down, I didn't want to do it. Believe me, I can explain. Don't lie to me. However, when you give the gun back, after the Lisa Trevor fight, she completely drops it. Like, what on earth? Leave this place up to me, and go on ahead. Okay. Rebecca overall feels a lot more distant with Chris, but her initial piece of dialogue is particularly baffling. You. Chris Redfield, Alpha Team. I don't think they have a history, but even still, she seems very clinical with her responses. Maybe she's just a professional and her young age makes her less prone to handling these situations well. Or maybe it's because of Chris's dead fucking eyes staring back at her. Jesus, dude. I also just can't comprehend everything with Richard on Chris's playthrough. If you don't make it back in time with the serum, Richard's dead body is there, and Rebecca isn't? Where the fuck did she go? If you make it back with the serum in time, he lives, but that means he'll eventually end up in the Aqua Ring. Why? How the fuck did he get down here? Last we saw him, he was resting in the safe room in the mansion. Even more baffling, if you do save him earlier, Rebecca won't help you with Plant 42. You have to let him die for her to be in the residence to make the V-Jolt. I feel like these should be flipped. Richard being in the residence doesn't make sense, but you'd think Rebecca would be out looking for him or something. I, j I just don't quite get it. When strictly viewing it through the lens of gameplay, it is somewhat of a trade. Either you get the assault shotgun after Neptune if you save Richard, or skip the first phase of Plant 42 if you let him die. Not a really big choice, but it's something. While I absolutely adore this art direction and will gush about the pre-rendered background soon, I can't pretend that some moments didn't feel a bit sillier this time with it in mind. Going back to the rhythm talking point from earlier, the Moonlight Sonata Room is exactly the same as you'd expect initially, but you'll soon notice that there's a small difference this time. The sheet music isn't fully there, you need to do more exploring to find the missing piece. The problem, though, is the Moonlight Sonata puzzle already had layers of ridiculousness to it, such as the keys on the piano needing to be played in a certain order to open a secret door, and the fact that someone kept that sheet music in that same room, on a shelf, hidden behind another shelf. Now add on to all that, someone tore out the part you need, and moved it to a different room in the mansion, in a shelf, behind a different shelf. That extra step just highlighted the absurdity of it all for me. I'd imagine this was done to solve a possible cutscene issue. The armor key opens both the music room and the hallway to Richard, so the devs likely wanted to make sure the introduction with Rebecca was the Richard incident, not the Moonlight Sonata, thus the missing score was placed behind that interaction. Kind of clever, but also a little absurd. I also have no idea why Wesker helps you during the Lisa Trevor fight. Chris, take a piece of the action. You're a bit of a mess up. Chris, take a piece of the action. Since we're on the more negative side, I can't help but mention how utterly stupid the Kenneth videotape is. It's likely going to be the first thing you grab, second if you snagged the ink ribbon. It says you need to find a VCR to play it, which is clearly intended to build suspense to whatever his final moments were. Considering that you only find the method of viewing it when the game is almost over, it being a boring zombie death is completely underwhelming. This should have been another damning piece of evidence about Wesker or something. Maybe Kenneth found something out before he got eaten and is trying to record his findings. Nope. Ah, zombie, dead. Who gives a fuck? You've already seen dozens of zombies at this point. 
The flamethrower puzzle being a Lisa Trevor chase isn't great, but it's not horrible either. Just feels like it exists to give her more screen time. More so than even Mr. X did in the RE2 remake, she just feels like an obstacle you have to take into account rather than something scary chasing you. The real flamethrower isn't as interesting, it's just there if you want it for the Black Tiger fight, and you'll need to set it down afterwards to proceed, but if you don't want it, nothing happens. Okay, I guess. The audio for the enemies is surprisingly not very great, in the sense that it keeps the same volume for them no matter how far away they are. This means you'll have to resort to the auto-aiming snapping or the back-away trick more often to figure out if an enemy is behind a corner or out of frame. For example, just listen to this room in the basement of the mansion. The zombies are actually way over here, and you waiting in place for them to approach just gives them more time to group together. Although the defensive items look like a solid addition at first blush, they don't really offer much in the way of decision making. They don't take up a real inventory slot, so there's no risk of choosing a defensive measure over something else. Using it or not using it seems like a trade of either losing health or losing a defensive item, However, because the daggers, flash grenades, and taser batteries don't get used for literally anything else, there's barely any reason to not use it any time you get grabbed. The only thing I can possibly think of is wanting to save a flash grenade for an important zombie kill to assure they won't return as a crimson head since their head gets destroyed. That, or saving them for more dangerous enemies like hunters? I just don't think that's enough. You're avoiding damage regardless of when you use it, and there not being any other method to escape from a grab unharmed just means it's almost a straightforward decision. Oh, I got grabbed. Spam all the buttons, including the defensive item. Obviously not a fair comparison, since it came out 20 years later, but Signalist has a similar item, and it takes up one of your six inventory slots. I think it taking up space at least provides a bit of decision-making when in the item chests. I also don't really love the fact that your character has to get ambushed in a cutscene early on by Lisa Trevor. Her being invincible is interesting, especially considering her backstory and how it ties into the events of this game and maybe even future titles, but I don't think she's particularly scary or threatening, yet to advance in the game, you have to let her smack you, resulting in you waking up however long later, five feet away. I assume they simply wanted an excuse to have a close-up cutscene of her entering the room for a fright, but I'm simply not a fan. That being said, I still remember how terrified I was back in 2016 when I first played the remake, the moment she burst through the shed door. I'll give it credit, I suppose, on that account, but the ambush is still lame. Her inclusion as a whole, in addition to the lore about the creator of the mansion and his wife, was very worthwhile, however. It spiced up the usual diary entries with some new stuff, which again, goes a long way in making this feel like its own game entirely. There were many other additions and changes which did the same. I mentioned quite a few earlier, but I'll list out more of them that caught my eye. While I still think the Cradle to the Grave puzzle in the original is a bit more interesting, in terms of visuals, and how much faster you can do it in this version, the Spotlight Color Puzzle replacement is pretty good. The Tiger statue asks for different color gems this time, blue and yellow, but the red one is still available. If you instinctively, or mistakenly, place the red one in the Tiger instead of the yellow, the Tiger spins around, and snakes get dropped into the room. The rewards the Tiger statue holds are both optional this time. The first is ammo, and the second is an ammo disc. Before, it was one of the crests to access the courtyard and the magnum. The ammo discs this time around aren't as well placed in my opinion. I do like the one behind the tiger, but since that's equivalent to the disc that was previously found in the second floor of the mansion, that isn't much different. The one outside of the second basement floor door of the lab is still there, but instead of hiding the other one in the tunnels, it's just right behind the laboratory door next to the previous disc. Logically, you could easily argue this makes more sense than hiding it behind a boulder, but these two being so close together make them less satisfying to discover. The remake's true ending basically rewards a player for doing the yellow gem correctly, and that's about it. Considering you need to get the red gem from the taxidermy room to proceed with the game, it really feels like a player would have to go out of their way to not get the yellow gem while they're there. The snakes that drop in the courtyard section are clearly more dangerous, but not in an interesting way. This one, through many times testing it out, always jumps out and hits you. I don't know if it does any damage, but one time it poisoned me, which... Fucking hell, man, come on. The password for the lab door being the word cell isn't nearly as thematic as the word mole. 
mole makes sense given the context of the sequel, since Ada basically was a mole in the operation, unless I'm misunderstanding things anyway. They also didn't include the small victory animation when you opened the doors like last time, which I was genuinely looking forward to. Being able to get rid of the beehive in the residence is a nice modification, but I can't say it added much. The item is right in front of the hive, you go around, use it on the hole, and you're done. The aqua ring and Neptune section I think is significantly better. Really, an enemy like this is all about presentation, since it would never be a good fight in terms of gameplay. Now the sharks aren't skimming a three foot deep puddle, they're in a giant pool of water and instead of pulling a simple lever, the player is thrusted into a high pressure situation. They'll need to fiddle with switches, buttons, and terminals, all while alarms are screaming about the shark attacking the glass. Afterwards, you even get to electrocute Neptune by pushing an electrical box into the water and activating it. I think I would have preferred if you needed to turn the electricity off yourself. Instead, it shorts out without any possible danger to you. The V-Jolt is now the number 20 instead of 16, and the puzzle to get into that room is a bit different. However, the room in which you gained the answer to it is pretty baffling. It certainly looks a lot more detailed and so on, but the spider that hangs onto the wall up the stairs next to the billiards table doesn't ever move. Maybe I just did something wrong every time, but I swear that guy just sits there for some reason. The remake including both iterations of the crank is kind of funny in a way. I don't think it even made sense to have both square and hexagonal versions in the original, but to keep them both in and not alter their puzzles feels very deliberate. So much of the game was changed, but these guys weren't. Seems like a troll move if you ask me. The arena for the first Tyrant fight feels similar. Now there's a wall, so you can't keep circling around the middle of the room. The bastards. Another fun moment was the bag of chemicals being used on the plant. Before it was straightforward, but this time, if you don't see which color waters what, you might pick the wrong one and spray the plant killer on five herbs, ruining them forever. The death masks make for a fun, all-encompassing puzzle, a fine replacement to the crests. The crests this time are solely used in this gravesite to unlock the magnum. It makes for a fun subversion, since you acquire the wind crest in the mansion, and might think it would have something to do with the octagonal indentation leading to the courtyard. Instead, that ends up being the umbrella emblem. I think the mask puzzle, which leads to the umbrella emblem, is far, far better than the previous four crest non-puzzle. In the original, if you accidentally pressed X near the indentations, the game wastes your time by talking about which symbol should go in which spot. It clearly hints that you'll have to figure the order out yourself, but no, you just use the crests and they go in at the right spot no matter what. At least with the masks, you'll need to stand in front of the figure it goes to, otherwise it won't work. It's still easy, but now you have to solve it. The crests actually get underutilized in the remake too, since after you inspect all of them, the character slides them in the right spots with no help from you. I don't get the point of these fake non-puzzles, but whatever. The basement being a room you can enter almost right away after you get the sword key, opposed to having to wait until the end of the game, makes a lot more sense for one simple reason. The cutscene where the zombie comes in and freaks the player character out feels more believable this early on in the game, where it didn't as much in the original at that point. Plus, there's now a down crawling zombie, so as an ambush, it's a lot more intense. Similarly, the hunters jumping in through the windows in this particular hallway is more interesting than just them being in the room already, and because it's tied to the player grabbing either the yellow or red gem, you can plan around it once you get a few playthroughs under your belt. There are quite a few quality of life changes which are good, and one or two that aren't as good. You can now combine ammo together while in the item box, you can combine it to the gun itself to reload it while still in the menu, you can now use herbs even though you don't necessarily need them, and best of all, you can swap grenade types whenever you like. Having to fire the bazooka until it emptied before changing to a much needed acid or flame round was very annoying. You can even hold more than six rounds of the same type in the launcher itself, which basically frees up an inventory slot. All that being said, I have a question for you all. When do quality of life improvements start to hurt the experience? For every game, that will have a different answer, but I'd argue knowing whether or not you've grabbed every available item in a room is going too far. Even if their locations weren't easier to stumble on this time, this makes the MO discs almost a given in this version. Maybe the symbols for the save points and item chests make sense, but it really seems like the map is far too useful this time around. Interestingly enough, in RE2, the map is less detailed, but it colors the locked doors. 
It doesn't outright say which is which, but you'll soon figure out that green means X, blue means Y, and so on. How would that not have been included, but the 100% explored coloring is? Very strange in my opinion. I realize the quick turn option is also something of a quality of life feature, and while I don't necessarily love that addition either, it makes a bit more sense considering you can't spin as quickly as in the original. I only have one more thing to really talk about in the remake, and that's the absolutely gorgeous environmental design. I don't know what to call this, uber-saturated, high contrast? I have somewhat of a fascination with old-school-looking advanced technology, be it monitors, terminals, and other machinery, and oh my god, the basement laboratory and the aqua ring sections are simply mesmerizing. It feels so cozy somehow, I don't know how else to describe it. Love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. Likewise, the red text itself, warning you of the explosive nature of the fuel canister, felt so cool. And it staying on screen for a long time before you can advance made it feel important, presenting the environment itself as something completely foreign and almost machine-like. I also really liked the loudspeakers shouting warnings at the player when in the Neptune tank and at the end self-destruct sequence. Emergency! Emergency! Unknown source of pressure detected. Locking all doors to achieve maximum safety. Reaching 30% of pressure threshold. Destruct system has been activated. All personnel must evacuate immediately. Deactivating and releasing all locks. I don't know, I don't have any high-level analysis about any of it, I just really like it. In 2006, a Nintendo DS version of the original game was released, Deadly Silence, which is just a clever way for it to technically be called Resident Evil DS. There were quite a lot of quality-of-life features included in this handheld iteration. The map is now always displayed on the top screen, and the gameplay or inventory on the bottom. I'd imagine the map always being right there, even showing where you are in the room as you move, would be incredibly helpful for someone's first playthrough. When your health is low, the background of the top screen will flash the corresponding color. I do think this gets moderately distracting, but it's at the very least interesting to see how much damage you take every hit, as you'll see it stay the same on a couple, then go to yellow, then orange, then red. It made me feel more confident in waiting until I got hit once or twice more before using a full heal. The knife isn't an inventory item anymore, it's always equipped and simply requires the player to hold the L button and attack. I'd imagine this was a carryover from RE4, since this released a year after. You can reload without going to the inventory screen, much like in the remake, but I'll be honest, I genuinely wouldn't care if that was never implemented. I don't mind combining the ammo with the gun in the menu. Unpopular opinion, I'm sure, but it's true. The 180 degree turn is here as well, but not the combining items when in the chest screen, exchanging bazooka ammo for a different type, or holding more than six shots in the bazooka. There are two things in particular that the remake doesn't have that this version of the game does. The opening Kenneth death scene shows his severed head rolling on the ground, but even better, every time you walk upstairs or open a door, you can skip that small cutscene. These two things were apparently in the Windows edition of the original, and yeah, in the remake you can walk up and down stairs freely, but honestly, how the fuck did the remastered remake not give you the option to skip the door opening animations? On a first playthrough it isn't a big deal, but every single one afterwards, these completely kill your speed. Deadly Silence also gives you the option to skip every cutscene, both the FMV and in-game ones, the latter being something the original didn't allow you to do. All that being the case, it's hard not to see this DS iteration of the original Resident Evil as the superior version. You could argue the lower resolution makes the game look worse, but I actually feel the exact opposite. A few areas in particular look so cool to me, like I'm wandering around in an overly compressed photo. The only other change I noticed was the camera angle in the poison gas laboratory room. Nothing really interesting or anything, but it is a little easier to see what's going on, I guess. Deadly Silence also includes Rebirth Mode in addition to the classic game. Rebirth Mode takes advantage of the DS peripherals, adding in gimmick stylus knife fights, puzzles that utilize the touchscreen, and you even use the DS's microphone to blow air into a STARS member to save them. To be honest, I think Rebirth Mode kinda sucks. Maybe for some people, having multiple enemy types in one room is interesting, but crows being featured even more, and combined with dogs and zombies? Nah, no thanks. 
The dogs breaking into a hallway they weren't previously in before is okay, but many spiders in the courtyard... Why the fuck is there a flopping shark in front of the waterfall? Breathing into Richard to keep him alive left me lightheaded, since I had no idea what I was supposed to be doing. I tried to match the heartbeat rhythm, I tried quick shallow breaths, then super deep breaths afterwards. I still don't know how it ended up working, but hey, at least I didn't pass out. He tells you to set the dining room clock to 8-12 and you get ammo? What on earth, man? What the fuck? The knife fights are just terrible all around. Even though you just cleared this room of zombies, there's more when you come back, but only sometimes? Why can't I use my guns in the first place? Just spam swipes and stabs, who cares? At the very least, these aren't completely out of place for the RE series, since there have been many on-rail light gun games, and these give a similar feeling. There are puzzle chests in each safe room which house some reward like ammo and such, not really anything significant. The only good thing I can say about Rebirth Mode is that there was a key item moved here and there, forcing the inclusion of a new diary entry, which hints at the new location, which ends up being in a previously explored area, and features a third fight with Yawn. Kinda neat, but it's a knife fight, which is, of course, awful. While our remake is a valid and competent way to experience the allure of the original Resident Evil game, Rebirth Mode in the Deadly Silent Edition mostly sucks eggs. Or maybe I just got really fatigued from playing this game essentially 10 or 11 times in a row. Who knows? There's a way you can play co-op on the DS version, and even a multiplayer mode too. The other players appear as literal stars, which is... interesting, I suppose. And you need to be in the same room as another person with a DS who has their own copy of the game. So yeah, great, I guess. Overall, I think this iteration of the game is worth it for the classic mode on its own. Being able to simply close the DS when I want to take a break instead of using an ink ribbon felt great. So yeah, Resident Evil 1. A game that holds up extremely well, both in its original state and remake. It's a classic that's easy to go back to, since the limitations and hard-to-overlook issues mostly relate to the presentation. Gameplay-wise, as long as you can get used to tank controls again, it's an absolute blast. I wouldn't fault anyone for only wanting to play the remake, since it does do a lot of great things, but the PS1 version honestly feels a bit more streamlined in my opinion. You run faster, you push puzzle blocks quicker, the mansion itself is a bit more concise, and the beginning feels more open. As much as I understand forcing players into the sword key route, since they'll then see the new staircase, cemetery, and main mask puzzle early on, the beginning 20 minutes of RE make are pretty restricting, and kinda bums me out every time I start a new save file. Plus, as much as the remake's dialogue feels more serious and intentionally cheesy, nothing can top the original dialogue. Is this...? That's right. This is the ultimate life form. Tyrant! <laughs> Chris? <laughs> Stop it! Wesker, you're pitiful. Before I do my outro, I want to dedicate a small bit to recommending Signalus. The story and lore are fascinating, but even if you're not interested in a more art housey narrative, the gameplay will keep you going. If you like the old Resident Evil games, specifically RE1 and Remake, I don't see a reason why you wouldn't at least kind of like this game. I've seen some people online claim to have liked our remake and hated Signalus's inventory space and backtracking gameplay, but that's truly baffling to me, since six slots is what you have when playing as Chris in RE1 and our remake, and backtracking for key items to place in locked doors is literally what these games are. Anyway, highly recommend giving it a go, it's easily one of my favorite games of the year. Thanks a lot for watching, folks, and of course thank you to my Patreon backers, some of which should be scrolling by right now. There seems to be something of a trend emerging. I've now covered the first game out of the Dying Light, Left 4 Dead, and Resident Evil franchises. Add in Dragon Ball Z Budokai and Hunter the Reckoning, and to a lesser extent EDF, and... Yeah, there are plenty of sequels I could and probably should touch on at some point. But I also have like a good 30 to 40 other games I'm interested in talking about on this channel as well, so really, there is no telling which sequel will get talked about first. If I had to guess, EDF would get priority, but I'm unpredictable at this point. Try as you might, you'll never guess what I'll do, regardless of what I claim in community posts or on Twitter. Okay, bye. Try and guess which ending clip I'm gonna use. Try and guess, try and guess, try and guess. You failed.